So I wanted to give you a little talk this morning, just a short overview about measles. Measles is a virus and the symptoms usually develop between 12, 10 to 12 days after exposure. It is highly contagious. Someone who has measles can readily spread it to others through droplet contamination, which means through speaking, coughing, sneezing, wiping their runny nose and, and, and other people, um, getting it on other people and, and spreading it from that direction. But what is, the, what is measles and why are we so hysterical about a rash, a fever, a cough, Sometimes kids get a little bit of diarrhea, and when the fever breaks and the infection is over, because the virus is there as people are detoxing the virus from their system, and when the when the virus is when the uh, when the fever breaks, they get something that's called desquamation of their hands and feet, which means the skin on the surface of their hands sort of peels off, and that's sort of the it doesn't bleed or anything; it just sort of dries up and, and peels off. And that is the marker that now the measles infection is over and that person, that child who experienced that probably has a lifetime of immunity. And if that child happens to be a female, that child has a much better chance of when she grows up and has children of passing antibodies through her breast milk to protect that newborn baby. There have been lots of studies about measles that go back a long period of time. In fact, there was a, that shows that the vaccination really doesn't prevent measles. And in most cases, the best it does is prevent the transmission of other people, uh, to other people. Because the virus needs to go on and on and on and on in order for it to continue to live. And so when you break that transmission, it stops the replication process of that virus and it just stops replicating and therefore it, quote, dies and doesn't spread on. There was a study that was done uh, by the CDC that was published between 19, that the total number of people was about 19,000 children between the years of 1985 and 1988, that 42% of all of those children who contracted measles had been fully vaccinated. 42% had been vaccinated and they got the measles anyways and it was about that time that they decided, well, if one vaccine isn't doing it, we're going to add a second vaccine to the schedule. And so instead of your child getting an MMR vaccine just at one year, they will now give a second one at um, five years. And just recently, ASEP has now approved a third measles vaccine in the event of an outbreak. Now here's the kicker. Measles outbreaks occur every two to three years, irrespective of vaccination rates. It's the life cycle of the measles. And what the studies have shown over the years, and they've done a lot of epidemiological things to try to like smash down measles and make it to go away, that they feel like you would have to have a 100% vaccination rate in a closed society, which means that the people stay in a very confined area that are all the people that are vaccinated. They don't travel, they don't go to other cities, there's no interaction between any other groups of people. So in order to completely eradicate measles, it has to be a nearly 100% vaccination rate within a closed community over a period of time. And since that's not realistic and it just isn't ever going to happen, we are going to see these measles outbreaks every two to three years irrespective of vaccination rates. The same thing happens with pertussis. Pertussis has a life cycle of about two to five years and we will see pertussis outbreaks every two to five years irrespective of vaccination rates. I want to read you one other thing about measles, which is a little disconcerting, and why I think it is so important for people who, um, to understand that measles is an important infection um, to the human, be human body. Actually, measles is considered to be a co-symbiont, which means that measles is, an important thing, uh, is important for children to contract so that they can pass important antibodies down to their children. So I want to read you this. This comes from the Journal of Tropical Dermatology, the second edition. This is a 2017 article. And it talks about the cyclical nature of, me of measles and how it goes in and it sort of um, infects, the virus infects all the different organs 
And what it actually does is it induces a high fever. And what a fever does is it wakes up your immune system and makes, you be, it, makes it responsive to additional pathogens that may get invaded into the body. The, white, the fever activates the cytokines, the macrophages, the white blood cells, the B cells that actually make the antibodies. Fever is so important. So when this virus goes in and, and, and it um, and, and, and disseminates to all the different tissues, particularly tonsils and lungs, the GI tract, it activates fever. And there were some articles that were, that were published back in the 1940s that said it's that, it, that activation of that high fever at the age-appropriate time to have measles, which before all this vaccination nonsense, the age-appropriate time to contract measles was somewhere between about seven and nine years of age. And what that did was it locked in the basement, the fever locked in the basement membranes of your gut uh, your, uh, and your kidneys and um, your blood-brain barrier, and it taught the body a lesson to recognize self, your own proteins that were different from foreign proteins. And it burned off any residual proteins that may have been there from birth or from your mother or from other types of uh, infections that you'd had much earlier. So age-appropriate measles at somewhere between seven and nine years of age is very important for the human genome. And by eliminating the body's ability to contract measles and have this um, fever episode at the age appropriate a time, what is happening by all of this vaccination is that we're moving the susceptibility of children to measles to an earlier and earlier age so that children under a year of age are now more susceptible to measles. And the biggest problem is, is that the mothers who had natural measles and had natural measles immunity and IgG antibodies could pass natural high levels of protection through their breast milk to their infants to protect them while they're in that very young vulnerable age to wait until they got older that they got age appropriate measles. But now that we are vaccinating everyone and the children are growing up that, that had the measles vaccine as a child are growing up um, to being adults and starting to have children, the antibody levels from the vac in the vaccinated mothers are much lower and the antibodies are not as strong as the antibodies of, of mothers who had natural measles. This particular article that I want to read you is from the textbook of uh, Principles and Practices of Pediatric Infectious Disease, the fourth edition from 2012. <clears throat> Measles is, is an epidemic worldwide with few cases in, in closed populations. There's that closed population thing that I alluded to earlier. Before measles vaccination in the U.S., virtually all children contracted, in, contracted the infection. Epidemics of measles occur with regular frequency in two to three year cycles, and today that's irrespective of vaccination rates. Most, epi most measles epidemics occurred in late winter or early spring in crowded urban areas. Measles vaccines initially were licensed in the U.S. in 1963. That, was a, 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 that particular brand was discontinued, and the one that we use today was actually licensed in 1968. In the study that I referred to earlier of 16,800 cases of measles that occurred between 1985 and 1988, 42%, 42% occurred in vaccinated individuals. Now, here's the important part. Infants and young children are most susceptible during, this, during cyclical outbreaks, but protective transplacental immunity, meaning the ability of measles antibodies that the, when the mother had natural immunity or when she had an, uh, a, 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 vac a measles vaccine when she was younger. But this says protective transplacental immunity to measles is conferred to infants whose mothers have either had measles or had a measles vaccine. However, measles antibody titers are much higher after a natural infection, and infants' mothers who had the measles infection have maternally derived passive measles antibodies for longer periods of times than mothers who received the measles vaccine. And this is the key. Over time, more infants will be susceptible to measles infection at younger ages because women born after 1963 
have universally been vaccinated and will con and that portion of the population will continue to grow and have and and give birth so we are we have messed once again with mother nature we have eliminated a virus because we think that it's so deadly and we have no appreciation for how important measles infections are to children having them at an age appropriate age and then being able to pass that on in breast milk and across the placenta as they get older and start to have children. This all came from a concept in the 1960s called eradicationism when they decided that Perhaps we could eliminate smallpox with a, with a vaccine, and perhaps we can eliminate polio, then therefore if we just vaccinate, 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 perhaps we can eliminate everything. And it's a concept that the Public Health Department and the World Health Organization has adopted. It's called eradicationism. When this little cyclical epidemic is over, and they go back and they retroactively analyze the data, you can bet your bottom dollar that most of those children have had at least one, if not two, MMR vaccines. It's the same thing that's happened in past pertussis outbreaks. It's the same thing that happened back in the Des Moines um, mumps outbreak a few years ago that they found that something like 87% had been had at least one vaccine and, and um, something like 26% had had at least two vaccines. Don't hold me to those exact numbers, but they were, but they were uh, very high, had had at least one, if not two. So, what do we just discuss here? In summary, what do we talk about today? First of all, don't be terrorized about the measles. Don't be terrorized about the propaganda machine of the arm of the pharmaceutical industry called the mainstream media and whatever you're reading about the hysteria that of all these children are going to die. They're not. In fact, the vast majority of children will recover uneventfully and have a lifetime of immunity. Now, may there be one or two deaths when there are any type of infection? Yes, there could be. But are there deaths associated with the vaccine? Yes, they are. So the important part is health is from the inside out. What can you do to strengthen the health from food and nutrition and supplements on the inside of your child to keep them healthy and keep you healthy rather than pounding them from the outside with synthetic stuff and garbage coming through a vial from a, in a vaccine? So don't be afraid of measles. It's a fever, a cough, a rash. If your child gets a high fever, you do things for comfort. Don't run for the Tylenol. The Tylenol will shut down the body's ability to make glutathione and help, to, uh, help them to um, wage the war to, um, to navigate through this infection. Make them comfortable. Make sure they get plenty of water to drink. If it's a child, every take ice cubes, put them in a in a, uh, a cloth, take a hammer to them and break them into little tiny pieces, and every little piece of, uh, of ice cube helps. Um, you, you need to make sure that they're hydrated. So the hydration is important, cool baths, keeping them comfortable, keeping their fever down around 102. Um, it's not going to be a serious thing. So don't be afraid of measles. Support them. Know that if your child contracts measles, it's a good thing. They're going to have a lifetime of immunity. Just keep them comfortable.